Can we bow our heads in prayer, please? Father, in mercy on all of us, come wash me afresh in the holy blood of the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. For the blood of God, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin, past, present, and future, as we walk in the light that God has given us. So, come and cleanse me, and fill me afresh now with thy Holy Spirit, and speak to all of our hearts in these last moments of this convention. Thank you for everyone that has come to this conference, and thank you for everyone that came here, not so much to minister, but to be ministered to, and allow thee to minister. Continue, therefore, in every heart that is here for that purpose. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now we read in Isaiah 57 verse 1, The righteous perisheth. God gave me that in my quiet time in the chapter I was about to read. That day, the day my daddy died at the age of 59. And I remember going to my quiet time after his the news of his death. And the first verse I read as I opened to where I had left off was these words, The righteous perisheth. And no man layeth it to heart. Merciful men. You find that word is the closest in the Hebrew to godliness. Godliness means merciful. Kindness and merciful are linked to the word godliness. You could actually put those three words in and be accurate to the Hebrew. I don't know what your interpretation of godliness is, but kindness and merciful men. Merciful men, godly men are taken away. The righteous perisheth. No man layeth it to heart. Merciful men are taken away. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. And that's in italics. The righteous is taken away from the evil, literally from the presence of evil. At death, we are delivered from the presence of evil. But now in John 17, 15, the Lord Jesus prays for those who followed him. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Here we are to be delivered from the power of evil, not the presence of evil at death. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, that is, keep them separate from evil in this world through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now that is a staggering statement. Keep them from the evil. He didn't just pray, but he brought here one of the greatest and most significant things, if not the most significant thing you will ever know in Christianity, if you follow Christ. How God keeps us from the evil of the world, as Christ prayed through thy word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Keep them separate from the evil of this world through thy word. Thy word is truth. So we read here of death being the moment we are delivered from the presence of evil. But we read of Christ's prayer for us to be kept from the power of evil, to be delivered from the power of evil. At death we will escape the presence of evil, but while we live, Christ prays that we will be kept from the power of evil. We can't escape the presence of evil, but we can be kept from the power of evil. The presence of sin and evil, the presence of sin and evil in this world brings out the worst in sinful man who are born in sin, 
that is, they are born with a sinful nature. In Job 15, verse 16, God speaks of how filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water, he cried in grief. Micah 7, 3, that they may do evil with both hands. Genesis 6, verse 5, we read, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, is that you? Is that you? And God's judgment fell upon them at that time with the flood. Though Noah had warned them that God's judgment was coming, and God's judgment will surely come upon you. Well, he will need to apologize to those who perished in the flood of his judgment in Noah's day. If that is your state, because of the presence of sin, oh, Psalm 34, 14, Christ, depart from evil. Depart from evil. Do good. Hate the evil. Love evil. The good, Amos 5, verse 15. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Romans 12, 9. Exodus 23, 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to eat, to do evil. Romans 7 speaks of another caliber of man. Someone who longs for holiness of life but he experiences failure in sin. Someone who longs for holiness, that which God judged in the flood, and that which God speaks of, of man in his total sinful state, and how he will stoop to evil to any degree with both hands brazenly until every thought in his heart and mind is evil. God says throughout the day, literally in the Hebrew, just evil. But Romans 7 now speaks of another caliber of human. Someone who longs for holiness of life and yet he experiences great failure. In verse 19, the good that I would, I do not. The evil which I would not do, that I do. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, Staggering words of a man longing not for evil but for good, but he finds himself doing evil, that which he doesn't want to do. He finds there's something in him that still makes him go back to the evil, but his heart is not like the wicked in the days of Noah that just wanted evil with both hands. He wants good. I read this staggering article in the newspaper the other day. Hungry, two-faced snake bites the other self. Oh. In Kiev, that is, in Russia, uh, a snake with two heads. A snake with two heads. Here's the picture. Oh, it's awful. Each able to think and eat separately and even steal food from each other. <laughs> has become a popular attraction in the Ukrainian zoo. The small albino California king snake, now on show in the Black Sea resort of Yalta, is a handful to the zoo keepers. The snake's two heads are fiercely independent, are not always in agreement, and like to snatch food from each other, the keeper of the zoo said. Sometimes one head wants to crawl in one direction, the other head in another direction. <laughs> the worker 
added that he tries to feed the snakes two heads separately as they sometimes fight <laughs> for the food. If it's really hungry, its heads may steal food from each other. He said, adding, he also needs to separate the heads with a barrier. The second head may get angry, but both then feel full because they only have one stomach. <laughs> the private zoo said king snakes hunt for other reptiles, meaning one of the snake's heads could instinctively try to attack the other one. The snake is believed to be Europe's only two-headed snake and will be on show in the Ukrainian until September. Well, that's right now, last month. What a terrible state of affairs. Huh. Now, the scriptures speak of the same terrible state of affairs in one man. A double-minded man. Literally two minds, if you want to be honest here. He's unstable in all his ways. He's just a tragedy. He's just a tragedy, James says. In chapter 1, verse 8. But now in chapter 4, he cries, Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. That is staggering. You who have two minds, like the two-headed snake, with two brains forcing us to live double lives as Christians. Psalm 119, verse 113, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law I love. Now that, in the literal Hebrew, reads like this. I hate the double-minded. I hate those who are double-minded. Another way of reading the Hebrew into this verse, and this is the true state of it, context, I grieve at the thought or concept of being double-minded. O oh God, give me a singleness of heart. Romans, sorry, Psalm 86, verse 11. Give me one mind. I hate the thought of being double-minded. You want to put it into the context of what we're preaching, of having two separate minds and one, two separate things. O oh God... Teach me thy way. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Literally in the Greek, give me singleness of heart. One heart, one mind. Not two. Not a double-minded man who's unstable in all his ways. It's a staggering thing, these wars that have been going on in Iraq, Libya, When the American tanks were rolling in, I don't know if you remember with Saddam Hussein, he had a man called Chemical Ali. He was the right-hand man of this terrible Saddam Hussein. But he was on television, and some other TV relayed all over the world what was being said by this man in his language, the tragedy is what he was saying. He stood there saying, we will be victorious. It's almost like word perfect of Saddam Hussein. We will conquer the satanic, oh, well, that's what they call America. The great Satan. We will be victorious. There he is, and the cameras are rolling on. But the great tragedy is behind him, and he didn't realize it. The American tanks and armies were just rolling in. They conquered. He was in, they were totally conquered. They were totally in defeat. They had lost completely. And here a man, a leader, was standing up, propaganda, telling a lie. A false report, totally, of what actually was the case. They had lost the war. They were in total defeat. They were defeated totally while he cried. What was left of people in the nation that could look at him, we will conquer. We are victorious. Oh, isn't that terrible? So here we're looking at the man, 
And behind him, we know the man's either insane or he's a total liar. <laughs> Trying to give some hope where there's no hope. Oh, false claims by leaders. Gaddafi was the greatest of them all, wasn't he? Huh. False claims, I mean. My people love me. They will all die, each one to protect me. My word, if that's love, I'd hate to be a leader. <laughs> they wanted him dead. He was so wicked. I will be victorious. Oh, this picture, word perfect what Hitler said when he knew he had lost everything. Total defeat. You see, this can lead to great humiliation, false claims, denial of the truth, a denial, whether it's a self-denial of the true state of your life, as it was a total denial. They were in total denial of what was happening. Oh, what great humiliation this can lead to. This denial of the true state and just carrying on hoping that somehow this is all just mind of a matter. We're not in defeat. This can't be these American armies just rolling through victorious. We will still be victorious. We are the conquerors. Oh, denial. But oh, what humiliation it will lead to. It was staggering how in the newspapers a short while ago, one of the Islamic countries, I don't want to name a country, the head of the moral laws of that country, and they're very strict, I mean, whoa, steal, they cut up your hands. Oh, they've done that to multitudes in my lifetime. Islamic law doesn't play the fool. The Sharia law. Now, the head of the moral laws of Islamic country was sitting and the television cameras were relaying what was being discussed. But here he was at his particular desk with his laptop, whatever you call these things are. <laughs> and somehow the cameras picked up that he was watching pornography. Here yeah, sitting there, the head of moral laws of a country that really deals radically with those who are evil. In total contrast to what he should be, he's doing the wickedness that he's now going to judge others radically if they do it. Oh, denial, to live in denial of the true state of affairs in your life can lead to great humiliation as this man was horribly disposed and dealt with in ways I don't even want to begin to think of what actually happened to him. The newspapers aren't too sure, but he seems to have vanished from the earth. <laughs> How many men who preached in Christian pulpits to others were exposed to be in tragic sin? while they cried out to others to leave sin and to come to a life of righteousness. One after the other, in my lifetime, on the front pages of newspapers so many times, of some of the world's most famous preachers, exposed to be while they cried to others to come out of a life of sin. They were living in it. Like a denial of the true state to the degree that you actually can cry out to others and condemn Oh, how many preachers and Christians who condemn evil, but they're in the same situation. It's a state of denial of what the true condition is, but oh, what a humiliation comes. How many Christians are in defeat, total defeat. They maintain their testimonies in front of everybody. They put on a smile. They stand on their toes while they sing the praises of God's salvation. but they're enslaved to sin. If you had to stop here in your tracks and had a true, true look at your life and you were absolutely truthful for one moment in your life publicly, would you have to cry Romans 7? Would you have to cry out the words 
of a man that wants to do good, but he's finding it in an inability. He's doing that which he doesn't want to do. We need to brace ourselves here. We need to brace ourselves carefully here because God's word fearfully warns us, be sure your sin will find you out. That is horrible to say, but that's a promise. It's lovely to take the good promises that God holds out and says you can be sure of this, so we put our faith in them. It's a terrifying thing to take such a promise that God holds out and says this is going to happen. This I promise. Be sure your sin will find you out. Oh, now, of course, when we're in Sunday school, every single Sunday school teacher in history, I believe, used this verse and then some illustration, even if they were unsaved. Otherwise, they shouldn't be Sunday school teachers. This verse, you're not allowed to not. Otherwise, you are declassified from Sunday school teaching. <laughs> and so, the one teacher, when I was a little boy, showed us these pictures of this little girl with this dolly that was made in the old days, and inside was little wheat. You know? So, the brother was angry and horrible, so he took the dolly, the beloved little dolly, and buried it in spite, you see. So what happened? The water fell, of course. I don't know if this possibly could happen, but there you are. And what happens? The shape of the dolly comes out. With a little fresh vegetation. Well, be sure your sin will find you out. You know, it doesn't mean that. the Sunday school teachers kept us entertained <laughs> it doesn't mean that what does be sure your sin in the context and that's the only place you really can read the scriptures and in truth something terrible had happened that these people had done one of the tribes and God said these words to them be sure your sin be sure this will tragically affect you for the rest of your life. Now that makes it really fearful. This is really what God and they were tragically affected because of this terrible sin they did. You can be sure, God says, in the broader picture of why God even put it in the Old Testament because nothing is meant for history in the Old Testament. Otherwise, you are just a carnal academic without any discernment or revelation from the heart of God. The whole Old Testament, without exception, is given there in the light of the New Testament for you to know the heart of God, the warnings of God. Nothing is there for history. It's the living, vital word throbbing from the heart of God to warn you, to comfort you. It wouldn't be in the Bible. Don't tell me two-thirds of the Bible is history. It's vital. It's the living word of God. Be careful, be sure your sin will find you out as to you and me. Don't play the fool and think you can just carry on and sin. Be not deceived. What a man soweth, he'll reap. You sow to the flesh, you'll reap the flesh. If you sow to the spirit, of course, it's a different thing. If you feed the sinful nature, its appetite will just grow as you feed it until you won't believe what you're capable of doing. I want to repeat that. If you want to feed the sinful nature, its appetite will just continue to grow until you, as you feed it, until you won't believe what you stoop to. You will lose total control of yourself. You won't believe what you're capable of doing. Just feed the sinful nature. That's why so many young people are murderers. By just playing murderous games. You know the worst murder in Japan's history was so bad that I can't even tell you what happened, what was done to a body. They found out it was an 11-year-old child. You know why? He watched a film with his daddy the night before he did it and saw somebody doing this in some Hollywood drama, but it wasn't real. You tell me these things don't have a... You want to feed the mind with that? What you sow, you reap. And that's nationally, not just individually. 
America and the rest of the world, listen carefully here, you show perversions on television, you read perverts. You show violence, you will have violence that you'll be scared to go out of your door one day. You will reap what you sow, America, Hollywood, the whole world, if they allow what you make, even 11-year-old children. And don't tell me it's no argument. You have to have your head buried, actually the whole body dived on the ground. If you deny that these things are not reaping, we are reaping a subculture of violent, sexually depraved, uncontrolled children by what we're allowing. We want to jail them later on. Rather jail the men that are making millions doing it. And is that not the reason you're allowing them? Governments of the world, money! You should be jailed. For you made them what they are. There is a total loss of control to the degree you will sow what you reap, God says. And that applies even to a Christian. Actually, in its context, it is to those who are Christians. And those who are God's people that he warns. Oh, Sin is a terrifying thing. But let me tell you something that's going to really shock you now. Young man, Vanity Fair, and this is tragic news to you, but I guarantee you this, young lady, it will swiftly lose its glow. It will die as an attraction when suddenly you find your life destroyed by the sin you grasp with both hands and open your minds and hearts to. Proverbs 19, verse 3. The foolishness of man perverteth his ways. I want to read it carefully. Proverbs 19, verse 3. The foolishness of man perverteth his ways. Now, what does that mean? Literally, if you want to go word by word carefully and research, in truth it means ruins his life. This is God's word. Don't play the fool with God's word. The foolishness of man perverted, ruins his affairs, ruins his life. And his heart fretteth against the Lord. What does that mean? He becomes angry. He becomes angry against God at the consequences of his own sin. People's sin ruins their lives, but deep in their hearts they begin to blame God. The aftermath of sin's ramifications, we won't go into that, one of the great theologians of the world, don't dare believe there's no aftermath, there's no consequences. What you sow, you will reap, even if you're 11 years old and your daddy allows you to. Get it in your mind. You will become what you're allowed to take if it's sin. You will become. 1 Chronicles 4.10, Jabez called upon the God of Israel, Oh, that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. You know what the Hebrew means? That it may not cause suffering and pain in my life. Have you started to pray that yet? Oh, you're going to, but this man meant it. Oh, as he called out to God that thou wouldst keep me from evil. Why? That it may not grieve me, that it may not cause suffering and pain and hurt in my life. Esau sold his birthright, and he wept. But he never could have done. What was he thinking of? My mind can actually cancel out any ability to reason of the possibility of consequences when I open my life to sin. 
but I weep for the rest of my life for doing it. But as I'm doing it, he just cast aside any thought of consequences. What was I thinking of? That, I, that this wouldn't affect me for the rest of my life. Adversely. Psalm 69 verse 5. God thou knowest my foolishness. My sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee. O Lord God of hosts. Be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake. The word here is disgraced. Don't let me bring grief to my mommy and daddy. Don't let me bring grief to my wife. Don't let me become a shameful grief and curse to my children because of my sin. I knew a man who was a great preacher. He prayed a prayer, God, take me away because of what this is bringing on my family. And God took him. He had so brought curse upon his family for his sin. We sat with his wife, Jenny and I. Oh, he was the greatest preacher in the entire movement he served. No one could come near to, but he was living in sin. Denial and not dealing with it. And thinking you can get away with it. Oh, it will affect you tragically. Be sure, God says. Don't play the fool. We have a terrible enemy. He doesn't sit back and say, fine. If you got away up with it up to now, it's because he's just biding the time to wait to the moment he can do most damage to God's name, God's people, and those that love you. But he'll come in the right time. He's too great an enemy not to. The Lord ponders and watches to see what is in the heart of men. You know, God actually allows circumstances sent by Satan he doesn't lose control, and Satan isn't in control, but God tolerates. He allows to see what is in the heart of man that the Bible teaches. Why would God allow Satan to be loose from the bottomless pit after a thousand years of not having him around? For the original purpose, God allowed him anyway to have such liberties, to see what is in men's hearts who've never been tempted. Temptation is not just the devil in control. <coughs> God allows temptation to see what is in thine heart, God says. And also to show you what's in your heart. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know if you remember how the Lord said to the Rechabites, as he sent Jeremiah <clears throat> to place before them drink, alcohol, wine. On that occasion it was, even though we have many arguments. Why would God allow that? <clears throat> you see, they had made a vow from their father, should I say, that him and his descendant, descendants and they say, if you go over to the east today, you'll find the descendants of this particular man still. Every generation to this, you still find them. They have, do not set strong drink, alcohol of any form or wine before them. It was a vow to God. <clears throat> but here, the Lord said, take wine and place it before them. Now that, that sounds terribly cruel. But of course, they said, we will not. For the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us to drink no wine, neither us nor our sons forever. And Jeremiah was pleased with that answer, and so was God. You see, God allows temptations. He doesn't tempt man evilly, but he allows things 
to be set before us to see what's in our heart is a testing ground this world is. It's not heaven, it's a testing ground to see what's in the heart of a man and to show you what's in your heart. He tolerates even Satan. You think of Joseph with Potiphar's wife. Why did God allow such a temptation to come on this man? I'm not thinking of the broader picture of what lies ahead. If you don't go in foolishly into circumstances where there will be sin, God will give you the grace no matter what comes on you, if your heart's right. But he sees what's in your heart. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Be careful. Joseph did not choose to be in that room when that wife of that good man came to try and get him in such a horrible way of moral decadence. But because of his godly upright heart, and he proved what was in his heart to that woman, to God, and to himself, when you're in the circumstance you know what's in your heart. That's when you know what you are. Don't blame circumstances if you fall. Don't blame God. In circumstances where you do not seek for sin to come, God will say, why like he said to Abraham, I withheld thee from sinning against me. Because these circumstances weren't your choice. And you did this in weakness. It wasn't right, but I withheld thee from sinning against me. God will withhold us as he did Joseph. Every one of us, you will never ever find a circumstance that God will not keep you. But don't tempt the Lord thy God. Don't do something stupid. You don't jump off a building. And then say, God failed me. Faith in him didn't work. When you lie in hospital with a broken back. <laughs> Don't place yourself in circumstances ever in your life. Where you know you're in danger spiritually. But you know you went into those circumstances deliberately. You cannot blame God for your life being destroyed. Your children never able to look you in the eyes again without knowing their daddy's a defiled monster who betrayed us with filth and depravity. My mother knows, my father knows I'm wicked and evil. Don't go in deliberately. You're in troubles. But God will keep you. He will keep you, Joseph if it isn't your choice to be in that circumstance where that woman came. Flee youthful lusts, any circumstance where there are such things. And watch how God keeps you. I saw this in the newspaper. You see, if you don't like newspapers, come to this convention and you'll catch up in the world news. <laughs> This sip here in our country about a month or two ago was grounded on the rocks. Now, this has happened to so many in the Cape where we live right in the tip of Africa, the Atlantic, the Indian, the ferociousness in the rocks and these great vessels. To this day, we just see wrecks. And we've lived there now for many, many years, just one wreck after the other, just onto the rocks. And this one massive ship worth an enormous amount of money the cost of refloating the phonics. 22 million rands is a lot of money. <laughs> so what did they do? They had these experts to know how to get this ship that would made shipwreck. It really was through the storms shipwreck. Well, they decided that they could do something. So they made all sorts of efforts and preparation for one moment when the spring tide came in. And that means a high tide, a very high tide, which is 
depending on the moon and its circumstances as God made this perfect universe. But they knew just when the tide would come in an extra couple of feet, where there would be a normal... And that was the moment they could, and they did. The most amazing thing. This shipwreck was able to be sent back to sea, to float again. That was quite something. We have to do things, God says, if we've really got ourselves into troubles, if we've really made shipwreck through sin. Psalm 50, verse 23, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, but he doesn't stop there. To him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. He prepares the way for God to honor him again. You see, God waits for you to do something that you prepare for God to reach out to you again. If you've made shipwreck, if your life's destroyed by sin, if you've ruined and you're angry, but everything's wounded and hurting and shame and fear because of your sin, the repercussions, the aftermath, has hit back on you as God said it would. I mentioned the first night your future starts here when I saw that plaque. The rest of your life starts here. Wow, what an advert. Well, that's true. If you do something about the situation, I was with a gentleman in your country who was very broken. I will not say his name or his town or his state. But his son was exposed to be living in very depraved sin. So shameful that the whole home was tragically affected. Now the son, exposed in his sin, be sure your sin We'll find you out, God says. The son did something terrible. He disappeared. That's when I arrived in the house. The son had just gone. I was preaching in this town, in this man's church. He was an elder. So we prayed. And he wept, and you could just see on the mother, father, the other children, the weeping and the sorrow and the fear, all the shame and the shock of the evil in that boy's life exposed publicly. And now he's gone, disappeared. They don't know where, so they're praying. Oh, a letter comes. I have signed up to go to Iraq, to the front line. Daddy, I've so shamed you. I'm determined to die in battle. To somehow recompense for all the hurt I've given you. Because, Daddy, I know by signing up that enormous funds will be given to you and Mother, who I know need the money. And so in my death, which I hope and long for and pray for, I will honor you, and some good will come from my life after all the hurt I've brought on you and the shame. I will go into that battle determined to die, Daddy. That something good from me will come upon you. That is tragic. Micah, the wonderful book God gave us of God's heart to the sinner. Chapter 6, verse 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves? 
the euro? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for the tra my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No. No, boy. No matter what you've done, he has showed thee, O oh man, what is good. What doth the Lord require of thee, no matter what you've done? What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly? That means repent. Turn from your sin. Love mercy. That is, believe and hope for more mercy. Do justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with thy God. The Hebrew says, humble thyself to walk with God. In its tense, humble thyself to be able to walk again with God. God's waiting for you not to come with all the sacrifices of your life, your child. He doesn't want that. He wants repentance. He wants you to seek for grace to be restored and to be right with God. He wants you to seek for mercy and believe that his heart will show you mercy. Do you know the greatest appeal in the entire Bible? Oh, you people who don't believe in appeals, shame on you. <laughs> the whole Bible's an appeal. So don't judge me for making appeals. If you really want to be honest with every single book in the Bible. In James chapter 4, you read the greatest appeal ever written in the entire Bible to those who've fallen into sin, who are Christians. So let me read these few verses to you of James 4. He calls them adulterers in verse 4, and adulteresses. Not a husband betraying his wife. You are betraying God. You are betrayers of God. That's who he speaks. Know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth the envy, that the Holy Spirit that God has put in you is jealous? Do you think God says that for nothing he's in you? Do you think he says that he's jealous for no reason? But he giveth more grace. I love that. Any preacher that doesn't live for the moment where he can bring this shouldn't be in the pulpit. What's the good of whipping a man and saying, you're adultery, you're defying God, you're betraying God. You're unfaithful to God. You're like an enemy. You're with the enemies of God to the places the devil's children go. You're going. You're double-minded. You sit with the children of God as if all's well, praising the Lord. You're out there at the door and boom, you go to the devil's houses when you don't think anybody's watching. But God is watching. He's jealous. But he giveth more grace. I love that. But don't give up on yourself. He hasn't given up on you, child of God. No matter what you've done, he giveth more grace. But listen to what he does when he says about this grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, Christians. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. All heaven will make sure he does. The moment you start seeking God, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That's a promise. Call the devil a liar, or any man, but don't call God a liar. You come, no matter how far you've disgraced God and shamed and betrayed him, and been unfaithful to God, and you've been with the enemies of God, right in the heart of the world and all the sin of the world, you come back now, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. But come now, God always speaks when it comes to repentance in the immediate tense. Don't wait too long. You draw right now, he will cleanse your hands, ye sinners. He's not speaking here to unsaved. He's speaking in the context totally to those who've gone back into sin. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Let the blood go deeper. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. By the grace of God, bring me back to a true, consistent obedience to walk in the light I've been given. To pray, 
that prayer, David, for a clean heart to stop being double-minded, a pure heart. Be afflicted and mourn and weep if your condition is this. Don't you sit there praising God, sir, if this is you. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. You have no right to be walking and leaping and praising God when you're defying God, when you're in a world with a testimony of the Holy Ghost in your heart. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. But you have to do the one thing before he does that. Humble yourselves. That cost, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Come cleanse your hands, you sinners, you that are back. Confess. Come to God with words. If we confess our sins, that's to Christians. He's faithful and just. He will forgive. But you've got to come in humility. You've got to come in remorse. You've got to come in repentance. Not knowing you're going to get up and go on. No such a thing as forgiveness there. But come. He has grace, all the grace that's needed is still there for you no matter what you've done. No matter what you've done, Romans 8 follows Romans 7. Very precious. But God didn't just leave us there in this confused state that many theologians have great conflicting debates about. I don't, I just read it as it is from my heart to what I know is in the heart of man and Christians even. And Romans 8 goes on. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit, capital S, of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, capital S. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, neither subject to the law of God, neither can be. So then they that are of the flesh cannot please God. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you'll die. But if you through the Spirit, capital S, do mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That is an amazing, amazing statement. We don't end there. Isn't it Galatians? I memorized these books. It took two hours to quote Romans. But what a book on every aspect of man and God's plan. Oh, the greatest single document in the entire Bible of the Christian faith and in the world is the book of Romans. That's why God put it first in the writings after the Gospels. He says in Galatians 5 now, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, capital S, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now that is so important. You need to take hours and the rest of your life if that's what God says. Speaking of Romans 8, yeah. exactly what he was, walk in the Spirit, capital, and ye shall not. Actually, the Greek says you cannot. You cannot? Oh. That's a staggering verse that's right through 1 John 3. Oh, great doctrinal. One old man said to me, yeah, when you say you cannot, of course you can, but you cannot. Oh. There's a woman with a baby up there, and you say, throw the baby down. <laughs> well, I can't, but of course she can. But I can't. <laughs> a bit of wisdom there. The old man had, I thought, well, that makes it, of course I can, but I can't. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not. You can't. You walk, fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. 
These are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you want to. But if you are led by the Spirit, capital S, you're not in the law, now the works of the flesh are manifest. This is the evidence that you're still following the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such the like of which I tell you before and have told you in the past that they which do such things cannot and will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence that the Holy Spirit is in control of your life and you're pursuing and allowing it to be, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That word means self-control. Hallelujah. Against which there's no law, they that have, are of Christ, that they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now, if we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. This is staggering. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust after the flesh. Now, here's something there. He speaks of the minding of the flesh and the minding of the spirit. This has something to do with the mind. Believe me. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. That is staggering. Staggering. This is... What is this? Wesley. Okay. If people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, it's death. But if their thinking is controlled by the Spirit, it's life and peace. If you use the Holy Spirit's help to stop doing the wrong things that you can do with your body, you will have true life. It's the Holy Spirit, the minding whose mind is stayed on thee. Is the carnal mind, is the minding of the flesh, is the minding of the spirit. You know, and I was preaching in America oh, quite a number of years ago now, and at the end of the service there was this boy, who a man, with his little wife, they had a little baby, she looked haggard, he looked, God forgive me if I'm wrong, and young man forgive me when you hear these words, you looked like an animal. Sin had so destroyed you that I stood there trembling. And your wife looked like she was about to die, even though you had given her a baby. And then you said a staggering word to me I'm saved. And I trembled more. How do I reason with this boy? His wife said, sir, if you'd seen us a few months ago, you wouldn't doubt he's saved. Be careful, you that doubt. And do damage until you're so sure. If you saw us a few months ago lying in the gutters with drunks and drug addicts and perversions, you would know God has saved him. But sir, there's something over me. There's something in me. I just can't seem to function as a human after the way I've depraved my mind with the worst drugs, the damage I've done. Is there anything God's going to do to make me able to really function as a human being again? I know I'm saved. Things stopped that I could never stop before in one moment. But there's so much damage through sin. I said, listen carefully, my boy. Take this. Cut yourself off from everything in the world if you can. Because not much of the world will want you anyway. 
and soak yourself in this book. And I guarantee you, God will undo all the damage the devil's done through sin in your mind and life. And I had to walk away from him. I wish I could have said, sit. Let's start recommending books and this and that. Or video, no. Ah, long time went by as I came back to America and back and again and back. One day a young man walked up to me with cleanly shaven, short hair, dressed godly, little tie, clean, his eyes bright, and this little lady there with a little child and another little baby. <laughs> and I was talking to them and in the end he said, don't you remember me? And when he told me, my heart lifted up in joy. And I embraced him and I cried because I knew what he had done. She said, sir, he went home. His father's a Methodist pastor, evangelical one. And he said, Daddy, this is what this man says. Daddy, I don't want to live off you, but I need to do this. I need to stop everything. Daddy, I need this. You take as long as you like, boy. Daddy's in no hurry. If you want to do that. She said for three months, that was just the beginning. He got up early, he went in that room, and he spent hours with this book. Day after day, nights, days. And he began coming out of that room changed. More and more until he's what he is today, sir. Now he works. He provides. And I followed him when I saw what God was doing with the same thing you told him to do. They looked godly. You see, the word of God is the sanctifying power of God to undo all the warped, twisted hurts of your mind and heart. Don't doubt that. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Psalm 119, verse 1. Uh, there's a wonderful thing about the commandments of God. They don't only tell you to stop sinning. They enable you to. Sin will keep me from the Bible. The Bible will keep me from sin. Where do you see that in the Bible? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, turn from sin and be kept from sin, by taking heed according to thy word, thy word have I hid within my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Sir, hide it in your heart. Don't just read. And what's how God keeps you, sanctifies you from the evil. The presence of evil is escaped at death. The power of evil is escaped. When you're saved by Jesus Christ's blood. And when you soak yourself in this book and feed your mind and heart to the degree that no matter how destroyed your mind is, that even medical science tells you your mind will never be repaired by LSD and the damage is done to your mind, you will be repaired. If you had enough capacity to get saved at it. And on some vegetable because of your sin that can't even think straight. Or feed the mind on good things. Or it will feed on dirt. Because it will always hunger. And there is no more noble or effective thing than God's word. That will flood your mind with peace and joy. Because the effect of righteousness is peace. True peace. My peace give I unto you. Not as the world giveth. 
Give I, there's the peace of God. Great peace have they which love thy law. God doesn't lie. You don't only have peace, you have great peace. But you've got to love this. Oh, that was written when there was just the law. So now, David, now this is what God's word is. That was the word of God. Then we have all this, including David's Psalms. Love the word of God. My son Noel, the eldest boy, he couldn't go to homeschooling, okay? It was against the law. No credibility would be given. You were in trouble if you tried. You should, by law, have your child at school in our country. But at schooling, he was suddenly exposed. You can't keep your child in a fortress always. And he came home one day and he was weeping and said, Daddy, everywhere I turn is just sin. Every friend I walk up to to try and make a friend is such evil. <coughs> Daddy, the boy sitting next to me, I thought he looks clean. Let me at least sit next to him. Before I get through the class, the things he was showing me. Daddy, this world's so wicked. What am I going to do to stay pure? I said, my boy, I can't guarantee you much in life. But I guarantee you, you'll stay pure if you soak yourself in the word of God right through your schooling. Apart from that, I can't offer you any advice that I believe in and I'm sure of. You only have one thing to fear in life if you're saved, and that is to neglect this book. Because if you do, you will face grief as a Christian. You will know sin, and it will affect your life tragically. The time with God is all that matters. Oh, Marvin and Linda Struberg, is that right? You know them. You're not them, are you? No. <gasps> Thank goodness. <laughs> Lovely people. I preached on their son. Don't want to go back into that, but what amazing family. When I was in their home, by the way, they are so godly, it's actually unnerving. They are so godly, it's unnerving. You sit there trembling at the flow of the depth through the children and their minds, the knowledge of the word, even the children, the the zeal for souls, oh, the praise. Well, so he did something that you wouldn't expect a man of God to do at the table when a visiting preacher, he looked at brother, I've got something terrible to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. Brace yourself, but I'm going to tell you in front of my family. My wife beats me. I looked in horror. I looked at his godly wife. The countenance was so godly, it was unnerving. She beats me up, brother, every morning. He said, of course, I'm speaking about she gets up before me. <laughs> she always beats me. She, I try. I try to get bed early so I can beat her, but she beats me to the Bible to be along with God. <laughs> Ah, no wonder they're so godly. <laughs> and they still can have humor. Otherwise, God wouldn't have given us that if it's sin. Well, don't be a joker. But a sense of humor, don't judge. Because you'll be judged as a maniac if you don't have one by your children. Oh, let's not go in there. Huh. I wanted to visit a man called Reverend Seasby. I won't tell you the history of how I sat in wickedness and how they had a whole churches praying for me. And my friend, we were in such trouble, all oh, in our wickedness, before God said. So I went to visit him one day, years later, to thank him. And his wife said, you can't see him. I said, so I've come a long way. And I do need, sir. I cannot let you in. I'm so sorry. But I have. Come this afternoon. No, I, I, I cannot. And I don't know if I'll ever... I never did see him again. Can't you please? No. You see, sir, he has a quiet time. And I have fought 
off anyone who comes to this door while my husband's there. No matter what they've come for. I will never ever interrupt my husband's time with God and the Bible. Because if I just do that once, we will find other occasions. And my husband will fall into sin, as I have seen many preachers. And every one of them, sir, fell into sin for one reason. They were so busy with God's work, and, but they neglected this. I will not do that to my husband, Keith. Not even for you. Denny Keniston. No matter what you or the devil says, one amazingly godly man. Sir. No matter what you say. Well, I don't agree with him in everything. Nor do I agree with Bill Gothard in everything. But I love them because I can't stand in their shadow. I don't ostracize people. I don't agree with everything. I thank God for the, what they've done with that, which I do agree with, and staggered the world. Millions. Gothard has staggered millions to walk with God, sir. I don't agree. Well, Denny Keniston was praying when I was somewhere in his home years ago. And I said, what were you doing there? Were you, was there some sort of trouble? What do you mean? Oh, oh no, so sorry, I didn't know you could. Oh, yeah, I read through the New Testament twice a month, aloud. I find that gets into my mind the clarity, the swiftness with which I can read without any diversions in my mind or distractions. I read it aloud. Twice a month, New Testament. I don't know, but do what works with this book. You fall asleep on your knees? For goodness sake, don't ever get on your knees again. Get a good cup of coffee. Go wash your face. Now read. <laughs> but don't do what doesn't. What's the point of getting on your knees and spending two hours sleeping? Or struggling. Read aloud. Twice a month. Oh, Lord. Watch how much is here. You'll be stunned. His little boy, when I quoted the Sermon on the Mount, this little nine-year-old boy stood up afterwards and said, I can do that. <laughs> and he did. Word perfect. He even copied me some t <laughs> that me? You see, instilling it in the hearts and the minds. I was in Alaska, and there was snow. And as we drive, I said, how do you know you're on the road? <laughs> this is Oh, the man says, oh, I know. Listen. Brrr. What was that? They're so brilliant today, you know, that if you even drive, brrr. Hmm. Keep right. Have you heard these voices? I said, turn left. What's wrong with you? That literally happened to me. <laughs> so I said to her, you can't turn. Then I realized it's not a human. Anyway, I'm a bit backwards. <laughs> huh. So you're driving there. There wasn't electrical equipment on the roads there because of the snow and the flatness and great sections of Alaska and just snow and you don't... You know, night, day, that you're right in the center because if you go slightly off, they've made a grid that makes your car go... Brrr, both sides, brrr, you see, brrr, you know, the moment, brrr, oh, I'm sleeping. Brrr. Oh, that's wonderful. Let me shock you. You will never, ever know as a Christian that you've gone off the mark 
into dangerous territory. You will never ever know that or ever be fearful or alert or even able to do something about it unless you soak yourself in the Bible. But if you do daily as the greatest priority and discipline in your life that nothing will touch and no one, not anyone the devil sends, not anything the devil does, you will never divert from this for anything until you know God's word has renewed you day by day and no other renewing to walk with God. You will never know when you've done something wrong or you're in evil territory or danger or even diverting. You won't even know until you're in it. Shipwreck. Unless you soak yourself in the word of God. But let me tell you something wonderful. The devil can't touch you. If you never neglect that book. As the greatest priority and discipline in your life. So... You've made shipwreck, have you? For God's sake, don't go to war and kill yourself, boy, to do something good to your daddy. Get right with God. And then do what's right, to never, ever shame them again. And there's no man that will judge you. There's no father that won't love you dearly, no matter what you did. There's no sister that will look at you, despising you for the shame. No ways. You get right with God if every Christian on earth will look at you and love you and respect you. No one will judge you. God will make sure of that or God will judge them. Can we stand?